Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Archivist of the United States, the Honorable David Ferriero. So welcome to my house. <laughs> it's great to have you here. And you know, I was thinking as I was coming down the stairs, Franklin Roosevelt created the National Archives. It wasn't until that administration that we had a National Archives. And I think he would be pretty pleased about this series of programs. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome to the William G. McGowan Theater for Platinum Age of the Cocktail the last in our 10-part series in the history of the cocktail. As, you, as I hope you know, this um, program is a conjunction. The series has been in, in conjunction with our special exhibit, Spirited Republic, Alcohol in American History, which is now on display upstairs in the Lawrence F. O'Brien Gallery. And if you haven't had a chance to see the exhibit, please, please, please make sure that you do, because it closes on Sunday, January 10th. So this will be your last chance to take a look at it. In the exhibit are over 100 archived documents and artifacts that explore the history of alcohol in America, including FDR's cocktail shaker, and the receipt for wine and kegs purchased by Meriwether Lewis for the expedition to the West, and lots of other wonderful and not so wonderful things about our history with alcohol. So I encourage you to check it out. I'd like to now uh, turn the microphone over to my partner in crime, Patrick uh, Patrick Madden, who is the direct, executive director of the Foundation for the National Archives, who supports all of our education and outreach activities. Patrick. Thank you, David. Let me add my welcome to the National Archives to all of you. Uh, the Foundation, as David mentioned, is the private partner to the National Archives. We are the ones that help fund uh, exhibits, educational activities, online resources, and in fact, your uh, proceeds from your tickets today also help fund exhibits like Spirited Republic. So thank you for that. If you're a member, thank you for your support. If you're not a member, you can go to archivesfoundation.org and join. There are lots of uh, great benefits of membership into the foundation, including a cut the line pass. So when it's a sunny, warm day in December like today, there's people standing in line to get in the archives. You can come in the member's door. So uh, check it out. Uh, it is really terrific. Uh, Right now, let's just jump to this program, and I want to introduce our host, uh, Derek Brown. Derek is the twice James Beard Award-nominated cocktail and spirits writer, a spirits judge, and owner of acclaimed bars you might have heard of around town, Mockingbird Hill, Eat the Rich in Southern Efficiency, and soon to be reopened Columbia Room uh, in DC. I know there's a lot of buzz about that. He is responsible for curating the series, um, which he has done so wonderfully. He's invited some of the top writers, bartenders, spirit makers, and thinkers to participate. In addition to being a leader in the classic cocktail movement, he's an expert in the history of spirits and drinks. He's traveled the world to learn and teach about drink and how it's an integral part of our culture. Most importantly, in addition to all of his accolades, uh, we feel his greatest uh, professional accomplishment is being named the Chief Spirits Advisor to the National Archives Foundation. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, Derek Brown. Well, my, let me add the third welcome to all of you. Um, I'm so glad that you could make it and that we opened it up so so many people could be here today. Um, this is going to be an incredible seminar, and I want to get to it as soon as possible. Um, but I also feel a little reluctant to rush through it and a little sad because this is the last one. For over a year, we've been putting on this uh, History of the Cocktail uh, seminars in conjunction with the Spirit of Republic exhibit. And um, it's been an incredible learning experience. There's so many people who have been integral to it and a part of it. And I've learned so much um, when I hear this sort of introduction, I'm an expert on the history. I just feel humbled, honestly, of everything I've learned in this past year. Um, so I'd like to thank a number of people who have been a part of it. Uh, and especially, I'd like to start with the people from my team, from Drink Company. And two people in particular. Everyone uh, contributed so much, including the volunteers. Um, but there are two people who really spearheaded it. And I'd like us all to give them a round of applause for Eamon Featherston 
and Angie Solomon. And they did that in conjunction with an incredible team here at the National Archives and the National Archives Foundation. Of course, I, I'd like to thank the archivist of the United States, David Ferriero, and uh, also Patrick Madden from the National Archives Foundation, the executive director, and Babs Panette, because she put so much into it uh, and made sure this happened in the first place. So thank you so much. Now, applause are nice, but the best way that you can support the National Archives Foundation is by going and contributing to them, becoming a member, and keep showing up because they have so many incredible programs, not just the Spirit of Republic, but there's so many things that you can see and discover here, things that are integral to our culture and our values, not just drinking. Those are an important part of it, but not just <laughs> drinking. Um, and come back. I think that's important. Um, I'd also like to thank all the bars and bartenders who participated. There's over 50 people in terms of panelists and bartenders who participated, and then numerous volunteers who helped them out. I couldn't name all of them, but I want to give you a sincere thank you. This couldn't have happened without you. Um, and so let's, let's get to it, shall we? Um, I'd like to introduce the panelists, if they'd like to come out. I don't know if they had walk-up music, so you'll have to forgive me. <laughs> um, you know, every single seminar has been just so incredible. I don't know if I could pick a favorite at this point. Um, but I know that this one is probably going to be my favorite in many ways. Um, because these are some of my favorite people. And they're experts in drinking, uh, <laughs> talking about drinking, <laughs> thinking about drinking, pouring drinks. Um, let me start uh, right here to my right with Jackson Cannon. Uh, Jackson Cannon is, um, well, he does so many things. He's an incredible bartender. He runs uh, a bunch of bars in Boston um, that he's an owner of as well. Uh, we have uh, the Eastern Standard, the Island Creek Oyster Bar, and the Hawthorne. He is the uh, head of judges for the Spirited Awards at Tales of the Cocktail, so I suck up to him as much as possible to try to get <laughs> him. Um, uh, to his right, we have Pamela Wisnitzer, who is a leading voice in the cocktail movement, or renaissance, or rebellion, or whatever you'd like to call it. Um, and she is the head bartender and has designed the program at Seamstress in New York. But she comes from many great bars, and she is just a great voice, again, in this movement. Um, to her right, we have Charles Jolie. Charles is, uh, you know, they're all arguably the best bartenders in the country and the world, but Charles won a, a particular contest called World Class, put on by Diageo last year. And he continues to go around the entire country and world. I think we were talking about going to Tokyo and uh, um, Turkey and, uh, and all these places he gets to go teach about cocktails. And uh, also bottles them and sells them under Craft House Cocktails. So. Uh, welcome. And then to his right, we have Jim Meehan, who uh, started PDT. Please don't tell New York. If you haven't been there, you must go. You must get his book as well. It's called PDT. And you can read um, his articles online at Tasting Table. He's the chief editor of some of the, the drinks columns. Um, also, he's the one who gave the name to this particular um, seminar, the Platinum Age. He was the one who said that. So maybe he'll, we'll get a little bit more out of him about why he, he said that. And to his right, Talia Baioki, who is the uh, chief, um, editor in chief of Punch Magazine. It's an online culture and drinks magazine, which you, you should go to right away and check it out. Well, after this seminar. Um, she wrote a book that is near and dear to my heart on Sherry from 10 Speed Press. And she has another one coming out this, this next spring called Spritz. So I encourage you to get all of those books, to talk to all these people, and to listen to what they're about to say. No further ado, please begin. Hello. <laughs> Hello there. Um, my voice does, doesn't usually sound like this, so you're going to have to bear with me here. But thankfully, I'm not going to be doing most of the talking. We've got these wonderful ladies and gentlemen up here that are going to talk to us a little bit about what makes what's just happened over the last 10 years in drinking so unique. Um, and one of the biggest things that, that sort of I want to touch on before we kind of jump in is is the point here in, in, you know, I think in Jim naming this era, era the platinum era of the cocktail, is that this is a new era. 
Um, it's not merely a, a re reenactment, as Jim called it, um, of the 19th century. And then I think a lot of the time when we talk about the cocktail renaissance, we talk about the 19th century, and rightfully so. I think we needed to look back in order to look forward. Um, and you know, with any kind of movement, it's, it's knowing the rules, um, knowing um, what came before you, and then building off of that, taking it apart, putting it back together again. And that's exactly what's happened here. Um, you know, and, and uh, myself coming from, I came originally from the wine world, um, and I, I've been a journalist for 10 years now, and covered wine mostly. And there was a moment for me um, when I started looking around at cocktails and at spirits and um, seeing the amount of intellectual rigor that was being put behind what was being done. And not only that all of these people that are sitting up here are historians of the cocktail in their own right, um, but these are, these are people that are pushing this forward so that when we look back in 100 years, this will be an era that is completely unique on its own. Um, so it's a tremendously important, interesting, amazing time to be drinking. And everybody up here, I think, would agree that this is the greatest time. We didn't, we don't, we didn't live in the 19th century, um, so we don't know what it was like then, but I, I'm pretty sure that, that uh, 2015 is better than 1890 not just in terms of drinking, um, but there, it's more sanitary at least. <laughs> so we have that. So I want to start this off by uh, tossing it to these guys and, and helping kind of before we jump into some of the micro topics, um, some of the things that have characterized this era to first talk about kind of how we got here. So when we talk about the platinum era, we're talking really about the last 10 years, about you know, 2004, 2005 to today. Um, and so I want to, you know, start with you guys and, and say, well, what are, what, is, what are the catalysts? What were the things in the beginning that kind of got us to where we are today? Yeah. You want to pick it up? Please? Yeah, I guess, I mean, I'll start it off. I, I would say, you know, you summed it up perfectly. I think the, this era has been defined, I think, by our own awareness that we knew something was special going on, maybe not right when it started, but, but early on within the movement, as Derek said, I don't know what we call it, the movement or the renaissance. Uh, and that sense of self-awareness uh, wasn't based on our ability to create a facsimile of what happened during the quote unquote golden age, but it was an awareness that what was going on was unique and special to our time. And I think as we've all been talking, uh, we, we don't have enough time to cover this in an hour, but. <laughs> I think as we've all been talking, um, we recognize this, I think, pretty early on. And I think we, we used modern technology, uh, whether it was the phone in 2005, all the way on up to social media now in 2015, to get in touch with each other in a way that we know that they didn't get in touch with each other in 1890. I think that awareness is what fascinates me as well about this whole thing. In 1890, people didn't no, they were in the golden age of the cocktail the first time around. They didn't see prohibition coming around the corner. Now we actually have the, uh, uh, the clear vision to know exactly where we are and, and so we can appreciate it and make sure it doesn't go away again. Mm -hmm. um, and we've been able to see it and really look back and, and, and see how we got here uh, to this fully independent state where the, the kitchen kind of gave birth to this movement a bit. People going out and enjoying dining, having higher standards, uh, chefs finding uh, their own palate outside of international palates, you know, making the contemporary, contemporary American style uh, where a lot of the early bartenders worked in those restaurants to begin with before they went out and then had enough of an audience to actually have full-fledged cocktail bars to today where you can have the, the myriad of uh, really specific bars, whether it's a gin bar or a tiki bar or an American whiskey bar or whatever it is down to just the neighborhood dive bar evolving into a real place to get a decent beverage at this point in time. We probably know about it because there's a hashtag for it, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to be honest. I mean, that's, it's such an awareness and has a lot to do with culture and society. Um, has a lot to do with um, people who are going out, as you were just talking about, especially the ages that they're going out, uh, differences of urban growth, urban renewal in cities, and people wanting to be part of the action, part of the scene. And I think with that comes a growth in the culinary ends um, and just an ability to be within their, their peers and their, their groups in a social setting, and that comes with good food and good drink. So yeah. gives opportunity and career opportunity to more people. And I think there's an optimism about the term platinum age that also speaks to um, 
you know, this recognition of the cocktail as Epicurean and the cocktail as having roots um, as Americans' contribution to sort of worldwide culinary culture, if you will. Um, and the idea that it's still expanding, I think, is encapsulated in the term that Jim has given this time um, and penetrating kind of into places where uh, you wouldn't have thought maybe when this started it could ever get to airports and chain restaurants and that sorts of things and eventually hopefully the home. Jackson is someone who is involved in, in bars and restaurants. You know, how important has it been, um, you know, to watching the, the food movement in America and how our values have changed, the things that we want from our food and what we're eating and what we're drinking. How is that, you know, we talked to in the beginning about the first wave, second wave, third wave, fourth wave of this, this cocktail renaissance. And now we're in this third and fourth wave. How important has, you know, the pro professionalization of, of restaurants and chefs and chef celebrities impacted cocktails? It's huge. I mean, it was where, for us in Boston, kind of where cocktails could be. Um, and still, to a certain extent, we never got the smaller speakeasy expression mm -hmm. that was part of that kind of uh, uh, impetus for us to, to dial back down in on cocktails carefully. And we'd go to New York to sort of see those places. But just due to the way the laws of the Commonwealth are, liquor licenses have this huge value. So they are generally reserved for places big enough and a big enough place is gonna have food as a big part of it. So um, we never really, we have a couple of bars that were able to be umbrellaed as different identities in a larger building with that license, but we never get that tiny micro expression um, up there. So you know, for us, uh, in a local sense, like that was, that was a key place. And, and obviously, it gives you access to so much more um, in terms of ingredients and expression, the, the kitchen kind of ethic and ethos. We use the same language. We use some of the same discipline. Um, so it's a huge influence on what we do and a recognition that while we're on stage and it is a public thing and we're all kind of a little tweaked and, and living off of sort of face-to-face -face pleasure with people, um, whereas the kitchen is kind of held away from that. Other than that, like kind of the process sport of it all is very similar. Um, so it's interesting to see um, the more talkative, more social, kids coming out of culinary school are already now with an understanding that they should probably stage in a bar as their kind of externship and stuff like that. So I think the connection will continue to be fostered and grow. Yeah. And I think too, like, you know, ha having uh, you know, cocktails, and it wasn't, you know, before it was always wine and food. You knew that wine and food went together. And uh, nowadays it seems like cocktails have to be part of a four-star experience. Like you can't have a restaurant that doesn't have great cocktails. It's just not acceptable anymore. Um, but when we look at the first and second wave, it seems like that was happening in specific dedicated cocktail bars, and that doesn't seem to be the case anymore. I don't know that the chefs thought we were going to stick around. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, when we opened our first cocktail bar in Chicago, yeah. it was very much restaurant and, uh, and bar, and uh, you know, the chefs kind of thought, oh, that's cute. You guys are going to, and the Psalms, I think, yeah. kind of had the same thing going on because it was yeah. so entrenched and, and, and such a part of culture that was food and wine, food and wine. But boy, how that has turned. I mean, I've done a dozen seminars in the past year on, on uh, food and cocktail pairing and flavor pairing in depth down, yeah. down into it. And it's become, um, and I think I have a lot of Psalm friends who even get a little bit jealous because uh, the work is done when the wine goes into the bottle. And, and it's a real art form to know that and know how to pair it. And it's, I have the utmost respect for it. But we get to endlessly tinker with mm -hmm. the end product to really tweak it and make it go work perfectly with that food to help elevate one another. It's an interesting time. What also what you also mentioned about the professionalism of this career, uh, the fact that you even use the term career with bartender. Uh, this is a generation of people that you can get into this as uh, a culinary art, as if you were going to chef school, mm -hmm. and uh, that is certainly something that uh, was not the case, yeah. not, not too not in the too far past. Yeah. And we were talking earlier, you know, Jimmy, you were talking with Derek about the fact that there were these mob bosses, so to speak. We use that very loosely. Um, in each city, you know, in the beginning, in the first and second wave, that if you wanted to open a cocktail bar or you wanted to do something in that city, you went to that guy. He was your guy. He was going to set you up. He was going to help you out. And now we're in this era when there's just so many more people that are in this business. Um, and the internet, of course, and media has facilitated the growth, the rapid growth, and, and you know, allowing all these bars to open. Um, and in turn, I think what that's led to is something, you know, as Charles, as you pointed out, a global style. Um, and, you know, if we were 
to talk about what are the, the tenets of this, this movement of this time period that are shared across shores. What are those? Yeah, I think globally it's incredible to, to see, and I've gotten to travel to all strange corners of the, the world in the past couple of years. Uh, that fact that that is even an option is, yeah. is an incredible testament to where we're at right now uh, and, and so many of our ventures that we're in. But um, I mean, this is not just London and New York and Paris and, and Tokyo, uh, where it is certainly, you know, the major cities always mm -hmm. give uh, give birth to it. But this is, you know, small towns and in, in within, you know, it's a, uh, uh, like I mentioned Krakow, or like there's a yep. cocktail festival two hours outside of Madrid. Mm -hmm. It's not even just in Madrid anymore. Uh, in Bali, and, mm -hmm. and you know, competitors in the global competitions from Trinidad, literally every corner. And then when you look into the U.S., uh, you know, we were talking about it earlier. Mm -hmm. This is every, any city where, where there's enough people willing to go out and have food, um, uh, there's gonna, the drinks are gonna follow closely behind. But because of technology, there is a global style emerging yeah. with con contributions from everybody, mm -hmm. from the early guys uh, that started and maybe the speakeasy style that did embrace the yeah. old school and went really onto the, we're making these historical replica bars uh, at the gym it, it mentioned to, uh, you know, infusing the, the Japanese style is mm -hmm. now very much part of the global style and that was unknown uh, 20 years ago because we can jump on YouTube right now and see the hard shake or see how to carve an ice ball or uh, whatever, whatever it might be. They were not doing that. They were not carving ice balls. They were not. Yeah. No. In eighteen ninety, no. probably not. I think what's really interesting, I mean, Jackson was talking about the licensing costs in Boston. I mean, for those of you who don't know, to open a bar in Boston, you have to find an, an, a, an a license that's available from a bar that's usually closing or, or whatnot. And those licenses can run up to four or five hundred thousand dollars or more. So that's why there are no small bars in Boston, is because it's a half a million dollars before you, you know swing a hammer. So I think that if we look at what's going on in the world, it's very interesting. We were speaking about this privately before. In many ways, there are many socioeconomic currents that have changed, that have kind of allowed this to flourish um, maybe unsuspectingly. And I think one of them is, in many ways, the failure of the American system to reward college graduates with jobs. You know, a lot of college graduates are now, for the first time in our history, graduating with four-year college degrees and they're, they're entering a workplace and they're going right home to live with mom and dad. Some of you mom and dads probably in the audience. Um, <laughs> and they're finding that a, a career in the bar business, they're making more money or as much money as they would make using their degree and they're actually coming into the job and bringing their, their education and their discipline and their passion that they had from school and they're enriching the bar business. They're enriching the restaurant business and it's been a huge boon to to our trade. Yeah, as someone who was a recession uh, kid, as we like to say, so I was somebody who graduated, had a job, had like two corporate jobs, and then recession happened. So then I transferred over when I just made rent at a sports bar, and I was like, no, this is way better than a desk. So <laughs> it's like Corona's all day, and I get so much money for it. So, um, but I'm, I'm, you know, and but I'm exactly, I think what Jim just said, I'm exactly that person, which is nice to be on this panel, is that I bring the the perspective from someone who did make that jump was from that from that group, the younger generation coming up, where we, there were no career opportunities. And right now, as you said, the um, undergraduates who graduate after four years, it's the highest rate of unemployment we've ever seen. Yeah. So um, that's why tech startups are huge right now in that world. Um, you know, creating your own business, being in the hospitality industry, ways to create yourself and create a career. And also, there's a beautiful community associated with it too. When you start getting into it, people appreciate that value as well. So I can say that that's exactly what happened to me. Yeah. Um, and it, it is something you shape and you shift and you, um, you take everything in your passions and your knowledge and you build it. And that I've applied everything, including going off to grad school. So um, it's a big reason why we're seeing more people go into hospitality. So. I think the other thing is that you know, before this time, the spirits industry, in, you know, look at uh, ad campaigns like Absolute's ad campaign in the 90s. I mean, the spirits industry really invested most of their marketing money in advertising <laughs> before the quote unquote platinum age. And around the time, around the same time that this kind of thing started kicking off in 2005, you have these charismatic brand ambassadors, most of them from London, coming over to the US. And, and really, sort of, market, education became the new marketing. And it was something that we'd seen before in America. The wine business did a great job of it. Uh, and, and it helped build the high-end wine industry in America to where it is today. But I think that the 
companies like Diageo through World Class and companies like Pernod Ricard through a uh, program called Bar Smarts have spent millions of dollars not on billboards and celebrity endorsements, but on education. And I think that's been a huge boon to this age and, and us as a you know, sort of group. There's one kind of aspect of their commitment to education too, which is kind of interesting to note, um, is that it creates these networks through which we communicate with each other. Um, you know, we can go into a lot of detail about how the internet has made that much easier. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is it's still uh, a lot of the kind of raising of this culture is based on um, personal relationships between people. And the education initiatives collect or collected at different points in time, right? Sort of the most interested in it people from different markets and put them together um, and created like face-to-face -face time for them to support each other as this thing continued to grow. And they, they've done that. Um, through both of the programs Jim mentions, world-class competition, um, uh, bar smarts, um, even you know Bacardi's foray into the heritage competitions and things like that, where they've created layer, layer upon layer of it, and people who competed in the early rounds now judge regionals, um, and, and it just helps kind of create that platform. Uh, mentorship's kind of a strong word for that, but for that sort of generational learning and, and connection and commitment to these ideas so they get shared more readily. It makes the whole movement evolve super quickly as well. You have people that are very highly educated. Exchange of information is, happens in seconds. It, yeah. um, and, and it happens to, so it's not like, you don't have to wait for a book to come out or someone to visit your market anymore. Even, you know, these seminars are put up on live yeah. webcasts or, or whatever. You can go back and watch them on YouTube. And so uh, you, you find tiny pockets that don't have access. You can't fly to every place, but uh, you can be global. In, in and and it's worked so. out. I mean, it was, a, it was like an intuitive leap for the brands to do it. It's not the, it wasn't the normal business model for spirits. Um, as Jim pointed out over lunch today, it was, but it's something that has really proven a, a huge, huge dividends for them because um, it, continues, it continues to grow and create kind of loyalty and understanding and appreciation of the brands. So. We should probably thank our, our sponsor from uh, Machu Pisco, <laughs> Melody and Lizzie Asher down there. Thank Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Paru. Pisco Pioneers. What's truly different is, you're right, I mean, the, the, this generation that's coming into this world has so much access to information, to education, to all of those things, and it is, it is, it is the, the clip at which everything is moving is so much faster. It seems that way, at least from a, a media perspective and a journalist perspective, that even the last five years has moved twice as fast as the previous five before it, maybe even four times as fast. So I guess the question becomes, when things are moving that fast and we're uncovering all this stuff, I think we've dug all that past up, we're still doing it, but then we start breaking the cocktail down. We take it apart, we put it back together. Where do we go from here? What do you do? What is the next, what is the next thing that we start digging into? I think the most interesting thing is that we're sitting right here in the National Archives and what that fact alone is the, <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's a mind blower, blowing yeah. thing to be in with a bunch of bartenders right here, but I think that I, I spoke with Greg Bohm, who founded Cocktail Kingdom, who is responsible for a lot of the, you know, the reissue of, of the old sort of canonical texts of bartending. He has the largest uh, sort of pre-prohibition era library, private library in, in, the, in the world, pr you could probably pretty much argue. Um, and he actually is most concerned right now about how much information is out there and how mm. incorrect it is. Yeah. So for instance, when you Google Corpse Survivor number two, the first 10 things that you're going to read about it may be wrong or are likely to be wrong. Yeah. So it's interesting that we're in the, the National Archives right now because in some ways there was no information 10 years ago mm -hmm. and now there's so much information and a lot of it isn't right. Yeah. So I think in some ways the next challenge will be how to collect and distribute the information in such a way that the, that the right information is, the, the sort of true story is told. I just Googled uh, the zombie cocktail the other day, it's a true story, and um, no two recipes were the same. Yeah. And I checked uh, 20 sources. Yeah. No two recipes, so that's yeah. just... So that's a problem. It's a huge yeah. issue. It's probably better than there being no recipes, but <laughs> yeah. it, remains, yeah. it remains a new yeah. issue that I think like the actual collection of data and deciding what's important data and what's correct mm -hmm. data will become very important yeah. very soon. I kind, I kind of think cocktails are a lot like fashion, um, and the cocktail culture is a lot like fashion. If we think about it, like you'd be like, ooh, shoulder pads, but in next season, shoulder pads are back and they haven't been around for, what, 20 years? 
And we're seeing that, like, we've already seen a big, like, circle, like, you know, 10 years ago, people, like, craft cocktail bars were like, no vodka. You know, like, this was a huge yeah. push that was happening. No vodka, no vodka. And recently, there's been, like, a, no, vodka's back, and we're accepting vodka. And it's, it's, these, it's, it's very cyclical. And I think that this will continue on with, like, cocktails. We're just going to evolve into, like, a, a much more sophisticated uh, model of it. But I, I see this as another trend that probably will happen where we revisit things from the past and really, you know, un unfold and unpack it and then see what we can do to elevate it to the modern times a bit more. Yeah. Charles, can you talk a little bit about, I mean, you come from a very high concept bar and that, that really changed, I think, the way that a lot of people think about the experience of drinking a cocktail. And that was something that certainly did not exist in 1890. People were not, you know, cracking open an ice cube with an old fashioned flowing out of it. It just wasn't there. Um, and you've used a lot of technology in that process. And can you talk a little bit about how some of these high concept bar, um, uh, some of these high concept bars are trickling down to the consumer experience? Some of us might not even notice. Yeah. Most of the time, we don't. It, it's you know, it all starts somewhere. If you talk, you look really look at the food movement, uh, foams, gels, yeah. jellies, like w whatever it might be. Uh, that you know, these things started in high concept restaurants and then trickle down and they become second nature. You know, even just the simple mooses and errors and things that you might do. Um, you know, they start somewhere and, uh, uh, and trickle down and become, become normalized. And so at yeah. places like the Aviary or Booker and Dax and places all over the world, really, um, the movement is big enough that they can, places like that can exist. You know, you don't want that to be your only bar in town. You yeah. want to have options, but it's an amazing bar to have. Um, it took the industry a long time to even accept that as a, place, as a bar. Yeah. They're like, oh, because they couldn't wrap their heads around yeah. it because it is experiential. Um, which I think gets back also to the, the crux of why we go out to bars to begin with, though. It is, um, it's rarely been about only going out for a drink. And if, <laughs> if you only go out for the sole reason of a drink, we can t talk afterwards and work through it. But, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, um, it's uh, you know, it is about the experience. And so in that situation, um, it was unique for me because uh, the owners let me, there, there was never, a, a, there was never a no, question everything, um, whatever, uh, we wanted to try, the artistic license was completely open to it, uh, and the techniques trickled down from very high concept restaurants, and so we had access to amazing tools. Uh, the tools that we, we would use there um, came down from the uh, from medical science, like very precise temperature control units. Uh, uh, the scientists who designed them got worked in making very precise medical units and said, well, this is found that food was a lot more interesting and he can use that same technology and, and have chefs use it, things like the anti-griddle uh, or like immersion baths that run at negative 20 uh, degrees Celsius or whatnot and um, you can make really cool things. With science. It. Yeah, science. That's crazy. Yeah. What about some of the, some people taking some of these techniques and, and, and thinking about also, you know, bringing it to a, a lower concept kind of bar where you're taking, I think, it speaks, I guess, to the maturity of this of this movement to say, you know, this cocktail doesn't have to just exist in this kind of bar, you know, in a place that's, and, and I think that we've always had like a multiplicity of styles of bars, you know, where you could have a great cocktail. But nowadays, you know, we, m most of us can, you can walk into sort of a neo dive bar and have great mm -hmm. cocktails. Like what is that, what is, where does that, what does that signal about kind of where we're going? If at all. I mean, expectation of quality. Yeah. And I think that's where we're at, and that's why we're all, and why you all are, are enjoying great cocktails. It's, uh, there's an expectation of quality that started with food. Mm -hmm. It's the reason that great coffee shops exist, that yeah. like, really nerd out about their coffee and make brilliant cups of coffee. It's like the first time, I remember the first good cocktail I had. I remember my first great cup of coffee where I was like, oh, that what swill have I been drinking for the last yeah. you know, years? And, and, it, and it changes everything. Uh, mm -hmm. We... We want to know where things come from. We ask more questions because of all the information we have access to. Um, and so it gives us a lot, it opens doors. And so much more uh, guests or clientele have been exposed to um, kind of the, not, not even just the quality, but the character of the information that goes into the drink. So the, the, how, the, the knowledge of ingredients, the knowledge of, um, of cocktails, even if they're um, not performed at the same level of quality, that basic understanding of, of really what goes in it, instead of getting a blank stare on a Negroni, um, which you, you could easily have done in, in, in hundreds of bars um, 10 or 15 years ago, now it's, it's a generally assumed cocktail even in a place not known for cocktails. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, I, I 
I, I, I'm sure that, you know, that often it's because you can run to the back and look it up on your phone. We couldn't do that before, you know? Um, so I, I'm sure that that plays a part in the mechanics of it, but really it's because there's so many more places and an entire generation has grown up with options for good cocktails and has experienced those options. So they, it's the, you know, as in most of these things, it's really the guest that drives it um, to, this, to this level of penetration. Yeah. We were talking earlier about cocktail books which is a signal of how the consumer has changed. Um, that now, you know, uh, cocktail books are immensely successful, have, have you know, continued to succeed. And some of the, the cocktail books that are selling are a lot of cocktails that you can't actually even make at home. They're concept books. But people, there is a certain level of connoisseurship that I think you're seeing for the consumer on the cocktail side. That wine is known for quite a long time now, um, but it seemed like in the beginning of the movement, People were kind of fighting for that really educated consumer that was going to geek out. And it was all, they were always there, but it seems like that group has just broadened in a major way. You also, too, Jim, talked about the home bartender and how important that person is um, to this movement. Yeah, I mean, I think the, if you look at the anatomy of what's happened in the food world in the last 20 years, you know, Chuck Williams, God bless him, just died. But Williams Sonoma, Crate and Barrel, Sur La Table, all these sort of kind of stores have brought professional quality cookware into people's homes. And in the last 20 years, people have kind of broken down the wall from their dining room and their kitchen, and they cook in open kitchens like, like restaurants. And they have, they've invested in Sub-Zero and Wolf Ranges and stainless steel appliances and Whole kitchen. Foods and yeah. farmer's markets have really sort of taken off in, in urban cities and have always been there in the country. And I think people are, uh, the, one of the reasons why people, as, as we were saying before, about people don't just go to a bar to have a drink, they go to a bar for an experience. And I think in restaurants, people who have all the same resources as chefs go not just for food and for fuel, but they go because they try to cook that food at home with that book after watching that show in their fancy new kitchen. They can't cook it the same as the chef. So the chef has become this sort of rock star because they have this, you have the same, you have the same guitar as them you can't play, and you can't play it like Eric Clapton. Mm -hmm. And I think that's... Yeah. That's what the same thing you see in restaurants is. And I think for us, like as bar tools and, and professional cocktail books and these videos have kind of come out, I think a lot of our guests are actually making cocktails for each other at home. And it's, it's the best and most important. I think it's why things are growing the way they are now. I don't think as much as the aviaries and bookers and daxes of, the, of, the, of this period mm -hmm. are moving the ball forward like no one else is, I think that it, it, this era is not about building a taller ivory tower. I think it's about mm. sort of like widening the, our, our reach. Yeah. How do we do that? Yeah. Yeah. There's we get, so much we inspire room. people. Yeah. yeah. And there's so much room for that growth because those really specialty bars are such a small minority. Uh, and some of the bars I enjoy most, it's the new generation of bars that are happening now are low concept. If you are dive bars, very comfortable places, places where bartenders and line cooks can go after work and have a drink, but with high concepts hidden behind uh, old school back bar and a great jukebox and you know dim lighting and, and, and great staff, and, mm -hmm. but you can get a great cocktail there. Or don't, get a, get a lager, get, get yeah. the, you know, watered down macro beer, and that's fine too, because you know, there's, there's a time and a place for that. You know? uh, and, and that is, I think, the future as it, as it pans out, because every bar in the, the country has lemons and limes and sugar in that, so like, why not squeeze them and make some simple syrup and you know, yeah. be able to get a decent cocktail? It's, a, uh, it's easy to make the transition once one yeah. person invests. Yeah, we, we, you know, now we, it was a big story in New York to have a, a Denny's that had craft cocktails in Tribeca. <laughs> and I kid you not, no, it's there. And, and Dom Perignon. Applebee's, right? yeah. Orange Perignon. County Applebee's. Um, but I, I think that it, it's, it's going in that direction. And Jackson, I know something that you're really passionate about is the fact that you know, I think people, because this has happened so fast, people are quick to think of it as a trend. Um, and I think, especially over the last five years, and anything that happens this fast and gains as much appeal, it's not mass, but it's certainly, it's there, it's, visual, it's out there. There's all of these big magazines are covering cocktails in the way they weren't before. Um, we talked about Imbibe Magazine and how it wasn't that long ago that it was unheard of to have a magazine fully dedicated to drinks. So, um, you know, to your point, is this going away? 
it's not going away. Yeah. Um, Denny's. Yeah. Go to your local Denny's. <laughs> Be there. Uh, it's, it's, again, it, it, it does come back to the consumer being interested in it um, and, and accustomed to it. And why would you give it up? I mean, because that's what it would have, that, was, that is what would have to happen. You would have to decide to no longer drink cocktails, and I just don't think that's going to happen, am I right? <laughs> please, please don't do that. I'm fine either way. I, I've said it before, I'll do this with or without cocktails. Only reason I ever tried to make a better cocktail is because I love making people happy at the bar. It sounds cliche, um, but you know, the backlash that came wasn't against good drinks. Um, it was minor and it was against waiting too long for self-indulgent performers to not necessarily get you a great drink. Yeah. Um, and and as, uh, as was said today, you know, if you walk into a bar that, that that didn't have that energy or ethos to it that wasn't, you know, sure, looking back for solid recipes and, and stories to tell, um, but was in fact like a reenactment of something that maybe never took place. I mean, you knew that and you didn't want that bar, and so those bars are going away. But cocktails aren't. Cocktails are proliferating, um, and solid hospitality will, will win, you know, uh, the next century, I'm sure of it. And I, and I, I actually uh, am curious about its impact or potential impact on our culture at large. Um, uh, one of the most mind-blowing conversations I ever had with you, Jim, is when you were like, gosh, damn it, it's, it's not the chains that need to know what we're doing, it's the airlines, it's the insurance companies, you know, it's maybe the government, I don't know. Here we um, are, they're listening. Here we are, <laughs> you know, like, um, you know, there's plenty of cute adages in our current culture, and you know, I don't mix cocktails, I mix the good people at the bar, is, is a widely attributed quote to many different people. <laughs> um, and you know, I don't serve drinks, I serve guests. I mean, these ethics and that ethos that is infused into the movement are the things that will keep it here forever, and our taste will continue to change and evolve, and we will find new things, and there will always be trends, and then they will be frowned upon, but the essential elements of this are a cultural architecture that I don't think can be dismantled. Yeah. I think if we look at what's going on right now, we, we can see that um, you know, Americans are learning that the things that we were fed in the 70s, the sort of engineered, genetically modified things that were created to perhaps maybe save the planet back then because people didn't know how they were going to feed all these people um, that are creating a lot of health problems in America. Like we're, we're learning basically that we have to eat better. And I think like as I've stepped back and thought about our career, like our careers in our industry, I, and I have to pinch myself and say, you know, why are chefs where they are and why are bartenders where they are? It's like, well, wait a sec. Chefs feed people for a living and people, if they don't eat, they will die. Whereas <laughs> if people don't have a Negroni today, they might actually be more healthy. <laughs> but, but, then, but then I like sipped my Negroni and thought to myself, well, of those great chefs, how many of those chefs run restaurants that don't serve alcohol? None of them. OK, so we're right back in the, at the table with them. And, and I think as, as we all think about it, I mean, I think the, the vodka soda, there's nothing wrong with the vodka soda. But it's an alcohol delivery vehicle, uh, you know. It's and not much more. Whereas a Negroni is something that is a it's a way of life. It's a story, and, and I think the stories behind it are very important. Uh, and they they sort of epitomize the sort of values that this generation is beginning to uh, sort of embrace. You know, we want to know more and want to we want to put better things in our face. We've given, we've given people a way to justify their vice yeah. in a really, in a beautiful way, you know. Like yeah, drink, we, drink less drink, of these things, but less, enjoy. But drink better. Yeah, I mean, when, we were, when we're born, we don't love alcohol. We don't like vodka sodas or Negronis. So all, <laughs> all cocktails are acquired tastes. And I think Speak people. Speak for yourself. <clears throat> <well. laughs> <laughs> Young Charles, <laughs> our king. Uh, but I think people want to acquire more sophisticated, you know, and more storied cocktails. It's fun. I mean, the fear of flavor has, is it's slowly gone. fading away, and it's amazing to watch. And you, uh, I always love working with the same guests over years who come in, and you watch their palates grow, and you watch them, their, their palates evolve and whatnot, and you can almost uh, draw the same uh, 
growth pattern for, for people uh, as they experiment with new things. And that takes a bartender who shows them the right way, who doesn't, someone doesn't walk in and you don't give them a Isla Scotch or, you know, you don't give somebody a Negroni for their, you know, like, oh, you hate gin? I've got something that's going to win you back. Yeah. And you drop a Negroni on <laughs> yeah. you don't, you know. Pink gin. Yeah, you know, you start with the Aviation or Southside or whatever it is or, you know, or some, or some Nouveau version of it, a Gin Gin Mule or something uh, and, and work from there. So it's a fun responsibility to have. I will say Americans are kind of extremists in a way, and I've noticed this, um, especially when you... No. No, never. <laughs> Our country? Yeah, we haven't talked about Trump uh, yet. Yeah. <laughs> Keep him out of here. Um, but it's, it, Americans are extremists, and when, you know, I worked at a bar, previous one, that had a lot of global um, uh, travelers and guests that came, came in, and when it came to Americans, they were like, I want spicy, and I want smoky, and I want my palate to be shock, 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 bitter, 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 and it's... It's very interesting to see also, especially, I think, especially in the past five years, how, you know, especially with the media interaction, with the internet, Instagram, things that are instant, want to see the coolest thing, want to taste the most interesting thing, be at the forefront of, of the trends, yet you want to be that person who's setting it, you want to be the person who's tasted it first, or, or saying, like, this is the most interesting thing that I've, you know, mm -hmm. I've consumed recently. And I think that has a lot of things to do with the, the new generation coming up with, with what they want to do with their money. Um, and just the way that America is going and trending in terms of the instant gratification and extremism. Well, it was proof positive when, when the economy tanked, the, our hardcore cocktail bars didn't suffer. The places that really stood out and that offered something really different, it was the average places and the mediocre places that got hit some of the worst because they didn't, people didn't go out less necessarily, or if they did, they were just more conscientious about where they parted with their hard-earned money, and so they were making decisions based on yeah. that quality. I'll have something, I'll have, have it less often, but I want higher quality. And to, to, to both your points about you know, separating the wheat from the chaff, now that we have all of this information, that's so great, but how do we parse through? So looking at what's happened over the last 10 years, there's a lot of things that have become, you know, quote unquote, trends or big stories. You know, things that have come into the market, Mezcal, great story. All of these things, what are, you know, I wanna e ask each of you, what's the thing for you personally that you think we're gonna look back, we cherry picked history when we look at the 19th century. What are we gonna cherry pick 100 years from now and look back and say, proud that that happened, specifically? I just think that 100 years ago, the bartenders, I don't think, were aware of, of the significance of what was going on. Yeah. And they didn't, they didn't leave a lot uh, behind. It was mostly an oral tradition that's had, to been, had, that's had to have been interpreted by our historians, like David Wondrich or uh, Jeff Berry or Ted Hay. Or, or, um, so I think, that, I think that what we should try to do now is just leave them a lot of information uh, like we should correct information yeah just leave leave uh, leave information behind so that they can look back and make decisions based on what actually happened as opposed to inferring based on context mm. yeah I mean it's been even in ten, the last 10 years though um, and even working at a, like a progressive cocktail bar if you will um, I think like it always does boil back down to the simple stuff like you say that the daiquiri is the most difficult drink to make, and it's the drink that I teach bartenders or, or guests that want to start learning how to bartend, and that's my go-to drink. It's like, I don't want you know, anything overly fussy or too complex. So it's like, I just want a perfect shake and daiquiri when we look back. And so I don't think it's going to be necessarily like the, the, the in the rocks, maybe like, you know, Mike, Mike it's the ice sphere cocktail that you, you break to, to get into the drink. <laughs> maybe that'll like play some place somewhere, you know, uh, as a, as a highlight reel, but the stuff that's going to endure. If you look at the cocktails, uh, the modern, the modern classics, if you will, that have caught, uh, you need to make drinks that are replicable anywhere. Uh, the, the penicillin, the Tommy's margarita, these things can be made anywhere in the world by anyone. You can make them at home, mm -hmm. and those are the ones that are go going to endure. Mm -hmm. um, I op also hope that we have the foresight and things like mezcal to, um, to not. Uh, let business get away with it too far so we don't ruin something. We discovered this beautiful classic spirit in that case that we don't let big business get too far ahead of it and, and take away the thing that we love about it. It's authenticity uh, coming from uh, people's hearts and, and yeah. being made really well and, and with care. Clearly the most important thing looking back from 100 years is going to be the PDT cocktail book. And if you don't <laughs> own Jim's book, suggest that you all go out and buy it. Maybe the and buy it. Cannon knife. But I mean, oh, thank you. Um, no, you bring Why? up an because it has pretty pictures. <laughs> it's a graphic novel with great drink recipes and living history. It also has instructions on how to set up a bar. So I, I think it's a reestablishment of a lost craft, and um, 
Um, I could tell you that if this were like 20, 30 years ago and my, my mother was in synagogue and they're like, how's your daughter that bartender? You know, she would, you know, yeah. she would get a very different glance. But now she goes to synagogue, you're like, we saw your daughter in an article. And like, I'm like apparently the talk of the synagogue. Yeah. Two things. <laughs> Shabbat shalom, everyone. So, um, <laughs> Um, but I, I, I mean, I can just tell you, like personally in my family, like I, it's just it would never carry the same weight that it does now. Like it wasn't like as well of a respected um, occupation or a career path even. Uh, my my cousins here, my uncles had a whiskey club. Like the, you know, they would always like take the little shots. And now my uncles are like, let me show you our whiskey collection. And it's like it's this big point of pride. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm just really excited that you know, all the bartenders who came before us that really, we, they were the rock stars of the town. They were like, they held the keys to the city. They made more money than the vice president at some point, you know, that it's, it's reestablishing itself as a valid, you could go to four years of undergraduate um, career and say, I want to be a bartender and people aren't really giving you sideways, sideways glances anymore. Yeah. And I think it has a lot to do with people who are up on the stage and the education that's continuously pumping out that's allowing us to make that change. People don't ask you what your real job is anymore? No, I don't like to tell him that. <laughs> I think, I mean, Phil Green, I don't know if Phil Green's out here, but he wrote a great piece in Eater about um, how the mojito was not, did not come from the Bogadita del, del Medio, and that Hemingway never probably went there. You know, it was something that they probably just cooked up. And I think that as we look back on history, I hope that, you know, some of the people who have made cocktail history are still, a lot of them are still alive. So I think that you know, just because something was written down doesn't mean that we should assume that it's correct. Yes. It's a good rule for journalists and other human beings <laughs> anyway. Yeah. So we only have about seven minutes left. We wanted to make sure that we had enough time so that you guys could ask questions um, of this uh, illustrious panel. Um, since you know all of this history is currently being made right now, there are two microphones on either side. We so, call this ugly lights in bars. Or just put your hand up. You can scream. Last call? <laughs> Whatever you'd like. I had a question. Well, first I had a comment. I'm really glad we've progressed past the Cosmo. <laughs> Still a great no, drink. We love that drink. It's a good drink, but uh, I'm happy to find The last find great sour of the 20th century. We love that drink. <laughs> <laughs> Made this possible, but that's, I'm sorry. Was that your question? I'm sorry. Um, I, my question was actually, can you talk about the role of this kind of like the rise in craft brewing, the rise of craft distilling. And in this area, even, there's been you know, sort of a resurgence in craft distilleries uh, out in Loudoun County and, and here in DC. So I don't know how much that impacts what drinks you make or, or what you're sort of marketing in your drink making. But I was hoping you could talk about that a little bit. I mean, I think it's got it's got a big impact, and we're we're gonna we're seeing like for just a few years ago, you know, maybe a hundred craft distilleries around the U.S., and we'll be up at a thousand or something towards the end of the decade. Um, so it's absolutely exploded, and certainly on the heels of of craft brewing. Um, and the long and short of it is, um, just because it's craft doesn't make it good. Although there are lots of good craft distillers, we know that when beer really launched, everybody got in on it because they were excited about it, and uh, they were an attorney that liked to brew in their garage, but maybe didn't necessarily make great beer. Um, so small doesn't equate to good, although there's a lot of experimentation that happens in these small distilleries, which is awesome. They're more nimble. They can move more quickly. They can do more small batch stuff and, and take more chances than, than big companies can. So that's really interesting. Um, of course, we love to work locally and we want to support local businesses. So that becomes part of menus and uh, some of the offerings that we have. Um, but it's like, you know, the bottle of Tanqueray is always going to be behind, uh, be behind the bar to make a great martini. Um, and so it's a, it's a great a great balance. Competition is only going to drive, make everything better for all of us. And so the more that's out there, I think the better. Thanks. I think the guy else? in the white jacket's an attorney who brews in his garage. <laughs> she, she just looked right at you when he said that. And you were like, ah, yeah, so what? And sometimes it robs us of things that we have been using that have gotten popular. Um, but then again, that, that's a window for other craft spirits. Um, you know, but we're excited by it because you know, what flows behind that scotch trade and that bourbon trade is, um, you know, is the mixing of more drinks, uh, you know, back and forth appreciation of, um, of kind of the, the and, and it speaks to the globalization of 
the industry itself. Um, so I, I think it's, it's a net, it's, it's way more positive than it is negative, and even the negative is a bit of an opportunity, is kind of the way it's I would look at it. It's also taking away our top talent from the United States. It's an exciting time, but like in the past two years, um, a lot of the top bartenders in different cities have left and gone and opened up these incredible venues or like become uh, the staples of these cities, like in Hong Kong and Seoul and in, like in Cambodia and Singapore. Um, and so for us, especially in the United States, like that's, that's incredible. It just shows like the type of talent we're breeding and how the world like want, is very hungry for our, um, our knowledge. Or thirsty, sorry, thirsty for our knowledge. <laughs> we're doing a PDT pop-up in Hong Kong for a month in January. So it's just, it's, it's, I think it's great for us because it means we get to go over there and learn yeah. from them. Question? I was, I was in Quinoa. What? <laughs> Good. They're already making waste stuff out of that. I, w I was over in London for 24 hours, and I went to, I think, eight bars that day. I know, don't judge me. But I, um, in like three of the bars, I saw them using clay, soil, and like other dirt elements to, um, to make, co like as part of the cocktail ingredients. So just saying, things, things are happening. Yeah. <laughs> These are I think the last spirit category to premiumize is rum. So I mean, I think rum is here and coming, and I think mm -hmm. craft spirits are also going to be really kind of something we're all going to be with for the next ten years, figuring out how that market is going to. Like we've seen in, in with craft brewing, how like the Sierra Nevadas and the Goose Islands and the you know the the big companies are already starting to swallow the smaller ones, which will, will thin out the rest of them eventually because of the distribution chain. So I think we'll be looking at craft spirits for the next 10 years and trying to figure out who's gonna, who's gonna be around. Great. They're called adultsters. I just found that out. <laughs> I would say, in a way, for us, the maker is almost um, an adjective that you can use to describe us. We want to create those variations ourselves, whether it's a cocktail, whether it's how we want to serve something, whether it's you know, all that stuff. Like, I'm going to make something with my hands that my grandma always did in Quebec. Maybe you have some. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Definitely. Look into it. They barely, barely drink, they barely drink Spanish vermouth in Spain. Yeah. yeah, it's true. It is delicious. I think you're just not Spanish vermouth part, but the other part was interesting. Um, I just, I mean, the whole part's interesting. No, 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 no. The whole part's interesting, but just to go back to your maker's part, sorry about that. Um, uh, uh, Pinterest has become really huge. Um, YouTube, Pinterest, Instagram, and ways to like do things yourself, as you say. And I can just say, like, there's one cocktail I had on Pinterest that got put up by a brand, and the amount of times I see that reposted, repinned, repinned, whatever it's, you call it, it's unbelievable. So I think you you hit the nail on the head that it's um, everyone wants to do it themselves. That's why you're seeing these like make your cocktail at home with everything except for the spirit and just add it to the, the mixture. I mean, it's they want it right there and then. So. I don't think we've ever been, so there, the food industry for a while, like chefs were very protective of their recipes for a long time, and I feel like that's dissolved largely. Um, there's whole debates about uh, cocktails and them as intellectual property, and, and uh, you know, you can't, you can't trademark a recipe or, or whatnot, you can't. Um, 
if you can prove that you came up with the first name for something, you could, you could lock that down. And there are a couple cocktails that, that have that. Um, but I think that it's a, this is a world of sharing. I mean, it's a, we're in a moment of sharing. Everybody is about, like, recipes for everything are out there. Um, and I, I don't think that bartenders in particular have never been overly protective, not since the, like the first part of the tiki movement where people yeah. did have secret recipes for things. Um, did, did anybody want to tuck that away? I think we're out there and um, it, would like it, to share it, our work. We, as long as people give credit when they use it, I think it's completely it's a fine. Simple, it's a easy. simple equation that it's far more, because we're in business, we're entrepreneurs, we're operators. It's far more competitive to share more than even to how much you create. The more you share, really, the, the more attention is driven towards your brand. So um, you know, it was always my natural instinct. And in 2005, when Eastern Standard opened, there was a question, are we going to tell people how we make the grenadine? And I was like, yeah, because that's not the hard part. You know? and, if, yeah. and winning is getting a Jack Rose across the street that's good. And it was just my, that was my personal instinct. Um, but it's proved out as a business model, I think, which is why it attracts people who also, who, whose instinct might be the opposite of that. that might, they might feel like that there's real authorship to protect. I just happen to not really believe in that. Like, I'm, I'm a bass player, you know, so it's like, the, you can't copyright a bass line. And I kind of think of cocktails like that more than I do, like, literature or sculpture. But that's just me. But it's, it's in our financial interest to tell you how we do it. It just, it's just better for, it brings more people to the bar. It's, like we said, it's not the only reason you come to the bar anyways. It's, you know, you can get cocktails anywhere. Uh, a computer can dispense perfect cocktails, perfect temperature, perfect dilution, perfect milliliters every single time. Far I want more that accurate, computer. Far more, <laughs> far more accurately than any of us can do, but I don't think we're going to be replaced by the robot bartenders. But we're, we're so much more fun. We are way more fun. <laughs> I knew you were going to bring up robots. Yeah, the robots are going to come. The robot bartender, it's so funny. It trips me out. <laughs> A terrific discussion, as you might have heard. Um, a couple of our folks up here have our authors, um, so you can visit the bookstore downstairs, the archive store. We have these uh, on sale, as well as many other Spirited Republic uh, items and holiday items. And because you attended this event, you get 20% off. So when you show up at the store before you leave the building, score on your discount by letting them know you were a part of the um, uh, part of the uh, event today. Well, I have a few thanks before we get out of here. Uh, thanks to our bartenders for making today's delicious cocktails. Todd Thrasher from PX. <laughs> J.P. Featherstone, the Columbia Room. <clears throat> also our sponsor for today's event, Machu Pisco. Thank you very much. And a special thanks to the drink company volunteers, as well as the uh, foundation staff, Pamela Evers, James, Keneal, Jordan, and Babs, who are around. Thank you for everything you've done. And we have, we have a few special people in this uh, event today. As you know, it's the last history of the cocktail for this year. Right, Derek? All right. <laughs> we'll talk about next year uh, in January. Uh, there are a few attendees who have not just come today, but they've come to all 10 events. Um, and so we'd like to honor them by welcoming them up front with a special certificate. Would Basil help me? Robert Yule. All right. <laughs> Vernon Stoltz. Vernon? Vernon here? Vernon might, he might have snuck out. Vernon Stoltz? Vern, come on. There we go, sorry. Rachel Dugans, Rachel, Rachel Dugans, yes, excellent. Dan Curtin, Dan, up front. Roy Wagner, is Roy here? Yes. Donald Morton, Don Morton, Donald Morton, thank you, all right. We're not, we're not sure if, if they're here or not, but I can't make this up. Tori and Scott Booze. <laughs> Are they here? They might not have made it, but just for the name alone, we're giving them credit for the 10th one. They can watch it online. Uh, so we want to thank you. These are people who understand the importance of drinking and history. So thank you.
Thank you very much. A couple last thank yous. A huge thank to Derek and his team, especially Angie. Thank you, Angie. Uh, Amen and Pamela for everything they did behind the scenes for Tensu. Thank you very much. Um, of course, the archivist of the United States, Bruce Bustard, who was a curator for the show, and Trevor Plant, who's one of our top archivists, who I don't know if he made it today. Did he make it today? Uh, he helped uh, Derek create the General's Order cocktail for us uh, earlier in the year. And then Jordan and Babs, who somehow cornered Derek and Angie 10 plus months ago and said, we've got an idea, will you work with us? It's been terrific, and we want to thank you for all of that. So on behalf of the archives, enjoy your holiday season. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.